Hey, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. And we are here with good brother and mensch, Mr. Andy Sheckman, for our monthly get together with Miles Franklin, as we'll be talking about the state of precious metals and the global reset as it relates to currencies and everything else related to that. So if you're new to the podcast, please do like, subscribe, and share as it helps the channel grow. As you know, Andy is a stalwart veteran in the financial services industry with well over 35 plus years in the precious metal space. And he lends us his time and expertise each month, which we always appreciate. Andy, good brother, how are you doing today? I am doing well, my man. Thanks for having me back. Good to no see problem. you again, John. It's always good to see you. Always overdue. And uh, we're always burning the midnight oil, the two of us, with all this information, fast and furious. Ain't that the truth, brother? That <laughs> is the truth for sure. Yep. Yep. You're you're a good family, man. That's for sure. Um, okay. So first question I'll ask you right out of the gate, which is obviously up your milieu, is as you know, gold has moved up about 25% this year, which is telling its own story. Um, it's also, as you know, backing the BRICS as well and the central banks around the world, which we've discussed at copious levels. So with that being said, do you see us moving back to a gold standard under President Trump once he's back in and her, him appointing Judy Shelton to help the Fed do that? Well, there's a high probability that we will see some form of gold pegging. Uh, excuse me, I've been battling um, this cough for the better part of three or four weeks. And I apologize if I, no, you're fine. I cough in between my sentences. Um, yeah, I do. Judy Shelton, first and foremost, we we talk about Judy. She is a gold standard advocate, first and foremost. And she's also made a statement regarding the 30-year treasury that I find to be as logical as anything I've heard in a very long time. And that is that she wants to issue 30-year treasuries redeemable in gold in an effort to draw demand back into the treasury market on any treasury that is of any duration because with inflation and money creation and weaponization the way that they are who wants to hold any duration treasury in the united states inflation mm -hmm. risk default risk sanction risk confiscation risk etc and then you look at at a system that seems to be moving in that direction with the BRICS uh, and embridge and their new unit settlement currency which we are being told will be pegged to gold at a 40% clip. At the same time, what you have is gold reclassified as the only other tier one reserve asset in the world. So every single one of these little crumbs, if you will, that we see, at the same time, you can look at the West, the IMF, and, and Kristalina Georgieva, who says the central bank digital currency not pegged to something. And by the way, she is the head of the IMF is just fiat, she says. And earlier in the year in 2023, a report that they wrote entitled Gold as a International Reserve Currency, comma, a barbarous relic no more, question mark. So you see from all corners of the globe, from the Western friendly IMF to the BRICS, to do Judy Shelton, where if Trump wins, he, she will be his nominee to run the Fed. Everywhere we look to the reclassification of gold to the central banks buying more than ever before, would lead me to say to, to to that question or answer that question, yes, there is a, a, I think, a significant probability that to some degree we will see gold tied to a new monetary system or maybe to two monetary systems, that of the BRICS and that of the West. So, yes, I, I wouldn't bet against it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it sort of begets the question. It's funny, Andy, uh, you were talking about Georgieva. And previous to that, as you know, Christine Lagarde was ahead of the IMF, and then she switched. And to me, I, was, I always thought it was funny. It was like, kind of like them jumping from the frying pan to the fire. They're just interchanging because it's all connected together. So as they, that one goes down, they all go down. Well, it's so, just like all the politicians ending up at Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan or vice versa. You know, it's yeah. The, the, from the frying pan to the fire, I think at that level is a very common occurrence. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I. I think that's part of the incestuous nature of it all that that lends credibility to the fact that that these all of these people at these level they they know the 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 playbook the inside scoop and that's why when you see at this level these types of moves being made and and some sort of corroboration on the other side of the of the of the world maybe not identical but but similar in terms of crumbs that, yeah, I think gold has to be embraced globally because 
we have squandered the trust of the world in terms of the management of the world reserve currency the way that all politicians have with every currency going back to the beginning of time. So I think it's, you know, this Keynesian based, I promise you experiment. I promise you, let's just trust each other where there's nothing backing the system has come to an end. And now we need to go back to a world where, you know, there's something standing behind it that that's more than the, the shallow, hollow words of politicians, if you will. 100%. Yeah, and it's very complimentary, as you said, to say the very least. So when President Trump wins in November, um, I think it's pretty apparent he's not, a lot of people I know, we like Greg Manorino quite a bit. He's a great guy. I just dis, I just respectfully disagree with him in the sense that he he thinks he wants to save the system. I'm pretty convinced that Trump is going to actually default the system because you and I have discussed it. There's really no way to save it. It's just too big globally. So when, with that in mind, when he does get in, um, is it pretty clear to you he's going to basically reset the system and, and then asset back it on the backs of what you were just sharing? Well, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, Vance, his um, mm -hmm. VP, says maybe it's not such a great idea to be the world reserve currency. And, and Trump is talking about lower interest rates in a weak dollar. This is not how you how you inspire confidence in, in the world reserve currency. Um, I think he understands that we are too far down the rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a probability. I don't know how high the probability is in a world of, uh, of uncertainty. There are no guarantees, only probabilities. Right. And I think there is a probability that indeed that is something he understands perhaps better than the other administration in the respect that when we look at the amount of debt that is increasing exponentially, and you look at the increase in the in the interest payments that are growing exponentially, um, it, there comes a point of recognition or realization rather that really there is no other way out but to either hyperinflate or default. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that from the standpoint that he's done this with his businesses and, and filed bankruptcy and come out the other side stronger. Maybe he understands that we've kicked the can so far down the road, we've crossed the Rubicon of ever being able to resolve it. Now, on one end, you do have that that kind of hidden bonus where, of course, at the meeting in Tennessee for um, mm -hmm. uh, Bitcoin, you had Senator Loomis from Wyoming say, yeah, we want to revalue the gold held by the Treasury uh, or by the Fed on behalf of the Treasury to a level sufficient enough to buy Bitcoin uh, or to fund partially anyway, the Bitcoin um, fund that would be used in Trump's mind to help pay off the debt. Well, what if you revalued gold to a level of 130 or 40 or $50,000? You've created a whole bunch of inflation for sure. You may have pissed off part of the world, but what you've done is now created a situation where your balance sheet is offset, the, the assets are offsetting the liabilities. In a world where people can see Bitcoin at these levels, in a world where people can see revaluation of, of currencies at levels that no one would ever believe, or, or, you know, when I started in this industry, the Dow Jones was 2,100. The first conference I went to, the guy was laughed off the stage who said it would go to 10,000. The one thing I have learned mm. is that markets go higher than anyone thinks possible. And maybe this is the only absolute in finance I've learned in 30 years is that Markets go higher than anyone believes and falls further, conversely, than anyone will ever believe. And, of course, you have, you know, wave theory and, and Kondratiev and Elliott wave, which are human emotions, which only exacerbate in this tenuous, tense environment we find ourselves in. So, look, I think that all of these things are, are very probable and um, quite possible. I think it would be the least painful for them to just revalue gold. To a, to a very high level, peg it to a new system, offset the liabilities on the balance sheet, and that would be our form of reset rather than defaulting and having the world, I think, look at the United States in a vastly different way. And after all, when all the central banks are buying gold at the level that they are, wouldn't it benefit the majority of these countries to have that happen? So, you know, look, you hear the Dutch National Bank talking about revaluing their gold holdings continuously. So I wouldn't take that off the table either. It would be much easier to deal with inflation than an outright default, which would which would in, uh, incur hyperinflation as, as everyone dumps treasuries and dollars 
and then try and start over. It would also squander completely and totally um, our our image on the world stage. So interesting times for sure, John. No question about it. Lots of possibilities. But one thing is sure. How the hell do you pay off 200 plus trillion dollars in funded and unfunded liabilities? It becomes very difficult. The one thing that leads more to your comment than just about anything else is the fact that of that 200 trillion, roughly only 7 trillion is owed to the rest of the world, about 190 plus trillion, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, government, military pensions, all of the US-based hedge funds, banks, and, and individuals chasing yield buying treasuries. The mm. majority of all the debt is owed to the American people. Much easier to reset on us than it is the rest of the world. So you know, with every passing day, I would say that some form of a reset is inevitable. What it looks like, how, what is the impetus? Is it revaluing gold? Is it defaulting? Is it hyperinflation? All of these things are in play. Not sure how it all plays out, but I do think there will be some form of a reset and uh, probably a whole different set of standards behind behind currency and maybe even the world reserve currency. So yes, oh, yeah. just don't know what it looks like. Sure, sure. You brought up uh, <clears throat> the currencies because you know we're big into the dinar and other things, and you see they're the what well, it ties into your world as you know because they're the uh, ninth largest gold buyer in the world currently at present, and number thirtieth in the world in reserves. And uh, we're going to talk about the BRICS at the very end because we always discuss that. I have a, a video I want to show you. I, I think I sent it the other day, but I, I'd like to get your feedback in real time for posterity. And you know you see what you know what they're doing with that and where BRICS is headed and. You know, I, as you know, we have Bill as another fellow Miles Franklin guy, monthly like yourself, and he always talks about how you don't have a numerator and a denominator, but at the same token, you have to kind of, as you know, read between those lines. It's the kind of it's a puzzle piece here, which is what we really try to do is you know put those pieces together with the help of, of great uh, people like you, uh, in the aspect that uh, you don't have a numerator or denominator, but you also know that according to different uh, statisticians, the the debt for the U.S. is somewhere in the 260 plus trillion dollar range. So you would have to think if you were going to bring gold and silver to its true value, like you said, it would have to be in the six figures and or you do a reset in, you know, with these currencies, with the gold and silver. And, you know, I don't know if you stair step it or how they're going to do it, but it has to become the standard of real money constitutionally once again. I agree. Uh, so as, as you know, uh, so um, let's talk a minute about the subject of CBDCs. We know they're going to try to push it. Uh, we certainly encourage people to go against it. I'm sure you do as well for a variety of reasons, but the enemy always tries to play his hand. So as the Fed continues to try to push the CBDC, it, to me, it conjures up a number of questions and I'll kind of put it in one bucket. How does that affect the public? How does it affect the banks and the credit card companies dealing with that? Doesn't that effectively doesn't effectively eliminate the need for those institutions? Or are we going to see banks look completely different as well going forward? Well, I mean, that's that's yes, it, it would, and this is part of the rationale between uh, by letting some sort of banking crisis ensue. These banks that are wickedly over leveraged and undercapitalized, <laughs> the five thousand banks around the United States, it would be far easier to issue a central bank digital currency through a handful of commercial banks that do things like mortgages and 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 loans, um, whereas monetary and fiscal policy could be handled directly by the Federal Reserve, which is one reason they want it, right? Because the Federal mm -hmm. Reserve can only do monetary policy, they can't do fiscal policy. If you marry, in essence, monetary and fiscal policy together with the central bank digital currency, um, you are killing two birds with one stone. You also, of course, put a thumb on top of everyone's every action. And this is the reason why I have always felt there needs to be some sort of an event that would get people to accept a CBDC. This is why I've always talked about incentivizing the world to shun dollars through weaponization, through going green, through inflation, through destabilizing the inside of the country so that you see a massive dumping of dollars. In my mind, this is how you get to that moment because when you see everyone dump dollars in favor, perhaps this coming week in Kazan, we find out that they issue the unit currency. And if they do, and all of these countries start to dump dollars, this is the beginning of the end of the dollar because as all those dollars hit our shores, creating a massive inflationary event, 
interest rates must spike to compensate for that or the currency dies. You can't have double digit, triple digit inflation. Well, let's go with double digit and only have four or 5% interest rates, the currency dies. So right. in that hyperinflationary in environment, interest rates spike to compensate, which blows up the banking system. And this is exactly what a modern monetary theorist like Leo Brainerd and, and um, uh, what's his name? Uh, um, uh, the lead economic advisor to the U.S. government, Jared Bernstein, they're both oh, okay. modern monetary theorists, <laughs> uh, inclusionary economists, whatever the heck that means, and and this is what they would want. So how do you get people to take a CBDC? By blowing up the banks, which would also blow up the insurance companies, which are massively loaded with treasuries. And if you blow up the store of value that people have, let alone what it does to the real estate industry or the bond market, this chaotic event, have no fear because Lael Brainerd is here and Lael worked with MIT while she was at the Boston Fed. She developed the CBDC. We've talked about how she already ran point for Fed now a few months ago, which is in in right now being tested and beta tested by a handful of banks, instant settlement by, backed by the Fed for, you know, um, like Venmo or Zelle for checks and wires. So you, you can't have 5,000 banks and issue a CBDC. And I think you have to have an, an an event that incentivizes people begrudgingly to take it because no one wants to take it. But if it means you starve uh, because your bank blew up and the FDIC says, yeah, anything over 250,000 will be covered. Well, remember FDIC has 148 billion or so in assets backing 18 trillion in deposits. And that ain't going to work. That's seven cents on the dollar. So at the same time, it also says they have up to four years to make you whole. So what are you going to do? You're going to starve, let your family starve. Um, and if people were then, look, you just take the CBDC, John, and all that money you lost, it will be in your account by nightfall. You can go buy groceries tonight or whatever it is that you need. I think that, you know, it's coming. And what does it mean to, to the credit card companies? Um, a lot of them could fall by the wayside. If you look and see, there are patents that, that Visa has uh, with, you know, with this type of technology. Um, it's interesting, during the Super Bowl in Tampa Bay a couple of years ago, Visa sponsored it, yeah. uh, along with the NFL, and it was a cashless Super Bowl. Well, how'd they do that? Visa actually had reverse ATMs in the stadium. You put your money in and you get out a credit card that you could use at any of the vendors um, at, at the Super Bowl. So, you know, there are there will be some survivors. There are those at the top of the food chain who will play ball and others that may not um, and may fall by the wayside. Who knows what it means to some of these third rate, third tier credit cards. Um, but to your point, this is a time of great upheaval and great change. And it, if you take the world's gross domestic product, all of it, and the countries that make it up, 99, if you take 99% of the world's GDP, the countries that make it up, so there's 1% that's not being accounted here, those countries have a CBDC in development or operation already, all of them. So you're seeing, we will see a CBDC. How do you roll it out? What does it look like? In this country, I look to an event to make people want to take it. And that right. event would be... A, a collapsing of the banks in my mind. What incentivizes that? Probably commercial real estate. Look at the inner cities. Commercial real estate is just getting started. All of these the problems in the inner cities are are eviscerating the small businesses and 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 the hotels and and the you know the conference business and all of this stuff. People are saying, screw it. You know, we'll go to a state where it's not scary. We're not going to go to San Francisco where the biggest hotel in, in, in the city just gave the keys back to the lender and said, take it. it. It costs more to run this place than it's worth. And so all of the businesses that sprung up around it and the, you know, look at all the, the businesses that are leaving San Francisco and New right. York. So yeah, ultimately there could be a moment where the banks collapse or lots of them do, which creates a run on the banks and you see a massive culling on the banks and Powell will say, see, I told you there was going to be a bunch of consolidations. I told you that he did. What does it look like? Don't know, but I do think a CBDC is coming. What precipitates its uh, arrival uh, and its rollout? Well, that's debatable again, but in my mind, it's an event. Agreed. And uh, kind of sounds, Andy, like uh, maybe having some cash on hand and getting gold and silver if you can. It's not a bad idea. 
<laughs> yeah, and I and I, and if you have cash on hand, it, I would never have anything bigger than a twenty dollar bill. I would have twenties, tens, fives, ones. Yep. Someone told me um, the other day that in North Carolina, one dollar bills are worth more than one dollar. Uh, in 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 the you know where everyone got creamed, right? Sadly, um, by by the hurricane Eileen, I think it was called. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a couple weeks ago that having something to to use as exchange like one dollar bills were really important you know mm -hmm. take a hundred dollar bill and go to a coffee shop first thing in the morning any day of the week and they look at you like you're holding them up i don't have that kind of change they'll say it happens all the time unless mm -hmm. you're in the casino in las vegas but if in in middle america a hundred dollar bill lacks liquidity you want small bills junk silver small gold coins uh, and hope you never need to use any of it. But why not be prepared in, in that kind of an event where we see things that no one ever would have thought possible happening too often since 2020? And this this example in North Carolina is is a perfect one, unfortunately. Yeah, and I know we've been saying, Andy, absolutely spot on. We've been saying to our audience for quite some time to have smaller bills because, like, also in throughout the country, you know, California here on the southern side, and Florida for you, South Florida um where there's where it's crop rich you know if you're dealing with a lot of farmers markets you know like i don't know sprouts or something like that or even family markets um if you have the the ones and fives you know if you, it's you're making it easier to, to for them to make change and this way you're not paying five bucks for an apple or something like that if you had a 20 dollar bill it which is really the really the the argument for pre-65 silver dimes quarters yeah. and half dollars yeah Minted prior to 1965, which are 90% silver by weight, roughly worth 20 times their face value right now or more mm -hmm. in melt value. So not only is it recognizable, it's coins, it's small, but it has great utility. 14 pre-65 dimes are almost exactly one ounce of silver, literally almost exactly. So you have 14 transactions with 14 dimes. These are the, you know, and in 1980, of course, I was only 10 years old then, but my dad has showed me newspaper articles in Minneapolis where I grew up. Where, where gas stations were taking, we'll sell a gallon of gas during the oil embargo uh, and high inflation for a silver dime. Well, back then with $50 silver, you know, that dime would have been worth four or five dollars in melt value. But so what? It's what they would take. And um, when people didn't have cash, give me a silver dime and you get a gallon of gas. OK, fine. This is one of the reasons to have that kind of utility proactively, not reactively. 100%. Um, I'm going to do something I don't normally do with you, Andy, which is oh offer a counter thought to what you were saying, because I want to get your feedback. Would it be okay with you if, if I give you an idea of what our team thinks is going to happen in terms of the next couple of months or even? Sure, that'd weeks? be great. Yeah. Cause look, okay. you know, again, just to, just, just I don't have a crystal thought. ball. I just try and, and, you know, Occam's razor for me, sure. from all of my research, what's the, what's the most possible logical outcome, but I'm always willing to listen because I'm not always right. Ask my wife, she'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, having met her, I, but she definitely mm -hmm. uh, speaks her mind, but solid like you for sure. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, because I think you're on the right track, but I think it will help. We always love having your feedback because it, it helps us put these pieces together. If you don't listen to someone else's viewpoint, you never grow. And I understand that. That's what makes you uh, special is that you understand that the balance of knowledge and humility paired together. And we certainly appreciate that. But our, our team's humble sort of thought is that, uh, you know, and this doesn't get political, but at the same time, everything kind of intersects, you know, it's, you can't, it's hard not to, yeah, sure. uh, you know, it's, it's a hard line to walk. But anyway, what we see is that once Trump wins the election, uh, that there, we got Israel who are rooting for, obviously, on the sidelines. We're very pro-Israel here. Uh, for the, the true Jewish people, the, they were watching for uh, them to hit those power plants of Iran we've talked about for Kim Clement, which will precipitate uh, China-Taiwan because he's going to let it fall on the deep states, meaning Trump's going to let it fall on the deep states, watch optically uh, the remainder of this year. So you'll see China-Taiwan, which is, you know, freeze of Vietnam, enough out of communism for the dong to happen. And that creates a series of hyperinflation but while everybody's looking at Israel and they're seeing the hyperinflation, they don't see what BRICS is doing, which we'll talk about at the end. And then, of course, Iraq with, you know, reinstating the dinar and all these other things that will happen from there. So we kind of see it as a mixture of, of almost like a, uh, a storm front where you have the hot and cold mixing together, but yet it exists in this sort of odd space. Because we're in a season, Andy, where 
we're, we're going to see things that people said would never happen or happening as you can tell. Yeah, I agree with that. I do. I agree with that. And look, uh, the world is so fluid, John, that mm. these kinds of things could absolutely happen. And I don't think what you said is so far fetched in any respect. Um, I guess we'll have to see how it plays out. And the interesting thing is we're getting to that moment. You know, yeah. you're seeing already this China Taiwan thing going on. You're seeing escalation in the Middle East. You're, you know, all of this stuff, which is happening. Um, there is no guaranteed outcome when you're talking a situation that is as fluid and as volatile as what we're seeing. So only time will tell. I don't discount it. And certainly uh, it would fit very similar to some of the things that I talk about. So yeah, let's hope that it's not so chaotic that, that you know, we see suffering globally. But um, I think there will be some things that escalate to a point of being... Um, uh, let's just say less than favorable for a good portion of the world. Well, yeah, if we can at least minimize the collateral damage as much as possible would be ideal. We'll be certainly praying for the Middle East for sure. Um, do you believe, okay, do you believe that, I think we've talked about this before, but it's a good revisal now with the situation where do you, do you believe that um, the, the gold is actually in Fort Knox or do you think it's in a combination of places? And it's a hard question to answer because I've asked this to Bill, but I'd like to get your take. Do, we, do you have an approximation of how much gold we really have? Because I know when you've met with Bixweer, I think he said we have like a million tons or something like that. We have much more than what they're saying. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, we supposedly have, I mean, aside from what Bix says, he has a belief that there's copious amounts of gold in the Grand Canyon. And, and mm -hmm. if you read his website and the articles and the old newspaper articles that are attached to it, you know, it's, it's intriguing, but... Again, this is speculation. Uh, and we supposedly have 8,332 or so metric tons of gold held at Fort Knox, which hasn't been audited, as we know, since you know, the early 50s, 1953, I think, when it has been proposed by guys like Ron Paul to audit mm -hmm. Fort Knox. It's been turned down, which leads to questions, of course, and you know, if you have nothing to hide, if it belongs to the people, then why not let it be audited? Uh, I would also ask what happened to Gaddafi's gold, what happened to Saddam's gold, what happened to the 12 billion in gold the Ukraine supposedly sold to fund the war. Do we have it? Where is it? What are, but you know, I don't think if we are moving to a system, as we said earlier, John, that is tied to gold in some form, well, it doesn't behoove anybody to be forthright about the amount of gold that they own or that they are in, in process of accumulating any more than it would China. Or, or, you know, Saudi Arabia is a good example. They got caught, in essence, buying 160 metric tons in the month of August without reporting it to the IMF, as they're supposed to, if it's bought through the central bank, which it was, but it got flagged by the Swiss export import numbers. Um, same thing happened with China with the, the London import export numbers. But, you know, as an example, you look at a country like, like China, if they buy gold from People's Liberation Army buys it, well, that's not... They don't report it to the IMF if if it's bought by a proxy bank, a commercial bank on behalf of the PBOC. If they're buying from refineries in South Africa or Switzerland, they're not reporting it. And as I've talked about recently, China is flying around buying dore and unrefined gold and silver from the Latin American miners, which is the the, the sludge or the concentrate. And the dore bars are, are crudely refined bars that get sent for further refining well, that's not reported because if it's not 995 or better, it's not reported. So there's all these loopholes. The rest of the world doesn't want us or anyone to know how much gold they're buying. And maybe the same thing is true about the United States in the respect that if we are moving to a system where the amount of gold that you own will be tied to your ability to, you know, to create money, in essence, if there is some sort of a peg and using blockchain technology, if you will, as a as the immutability, as as the tether, so to speak, to show everybody, yeah, here it is. It's open for everyone to see. It's audited independently on a continual basis, you know, that kind of thing, which, you know, has to be thought out, of course. But um, then, yeah, it wouldn't behoove anyone, any of these countries, to be completely open about the amount of gold they're buying because it would crowd them out of their own trade as, as, you know, information is so widely dispersed so rapidly these days. Everyone will go buy it. 
So if you know there is a time or an event coming up where you're going to say, okay, fine, we peg it to gold and pull back the curtain and say, this is how much we have. Well, it, you know, uh, who, who the hell knows how much we really have, but by the same token, who the hell knows how much anyone really has. And China's at the top of that list is a country that produces three to 500 tons a year, but, but their numbers are at 2,300. How the hell does that happen when they're the largest importers and, and producers in the world? It's not. And for most of my career, they, it was stuck at 1,200 and never changed. And everyone would say, you can't believe a word that they're telling us about their gold they produce, they accumulate, those numbers are, are nonsense. The same thing is true here. You know, it's 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 not in anyone's interest to be open about it. So, but it does, to your point, make you go, hmm, you know, why? Why wouldn't they tell the American public or say, yeah, here it is. This is here are the bars, go count them. Um, and it's always been thwarted. So it's one of those tricky questions to answer sure. where your mind can go a million different ways. But uh that's part of the problem, John, is that we're dealing in a system that is supposed to be about trust and we're not the most transparent. So if you want a system that everyone is inspired to, to be part of, you have to marry, you know, some form of tether with some form of transparency, and that's gold and blockchain technology. And maybe we get to that point where these questions become moot, because everything is there for everyone to candidly see. Yeah, it kind of seems, Andy, to me, like, as I'm listening to you, that it's like the emperor has no clothes. <laughs> yeah, it's the Wizard of Oz. It's the little old man with the booming voice. Yeah. And the fire and the smoke behind the curtain, but he's 85 year old frail man who can hardly walk across the street. Right. That's that's the, that's it. And you're right. Uh, and it's, it's not good when you talk about a system that used to be backed by something and now is backed by full faith and confidence and credit of a, of a country that is less than open and transparent, that is losing its faith in terms of all of the issues here at home and then is it broken insolvent so we don't have much in the way of credit so what are we we're a paper tiger or we're the little old man behind the curtain that has yet to be pulled back but you see you know these types of world events unfolding quickly i think the curtain gets yanked away 100 percent um andy a couple more questions just to respect your time um as we look at the landscape of everything we've discussed today what is your number one chief concern like uh, we want we're going to expect the best but also plan for the worst case scenario so that people are protected and measured and balanced out. What do you, what's the worst thing you envision happening or, or what do you think will jeopardize the future for most people in the U S God forbid it's world war three. I mean, you know, how close are we? You, you got, you got NATO encroaching upon uh, Russia and, and going in and saying, we're going to make Ukraine a, a NATO member along with Finland and Sweden mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, stupid. We are, allowing you know weapons to to be sold to to the ukraine and and talking about nato weapons to be fired into russia stupid um how does it go with the middle east china and russia have signed a pact recently to to strengthen their military ties iran is part of the shanghai cooperation organization and part of BRICS. and the shanghai cooperation organization is not only the largest regional financial group in the world but the the largest regional military group in the world. So you have Iran part of the BRICS and the SCO. How does that play out? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, these are very scary situations. So we have two hot zones. And then, of course, you have Taiwan and, and China. And, and look, China doesn't need to invade Taiwan, by the way. That right now, they're doing these this, this blockade that you're seeing, these exercises of a mm -hmm. military blockade, uh, a naval blockade, rather. Uh, it's just an exercise, but what if it's not? This is a, a, an island that after three weeks, they would starve to death. I mean, literally, they would run out of energy, all of the coal and all of the energy that is shipped there. They would run out of food, which is all shipped there, everything. Mm -hmm. And it would be chaos in a matter of it crippled them in just a month. Are we going to go and get in a war with the Chinese Navy and start a hot war with China? So you have three potential places, hot zones that could escalate into something, and yet they are also growing in terms of their, you know, their alliances. So that to me is by far the worst thing. Yeah, anything else we can deal with, but when you're talking hypersonic missiles and and you know the potential of of World War Three, God forbid, right? There's nothing that even rivals what that would look like ultimately. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's gonna. I think it's meant to look that way. 
but then it'll be used as a misdirect. And then you have Trump coming and making peace deals, which I, think is I hope done. you're right, brother. <laughs> I hope you're right for all of us, especially my three kids and, and the grandkids sure. I've never met yet someday. So yep. um, I hope God willing that you're right. Oh. I do. That's where faith comes into play, brother. We yeah. just have to, you know, put faith in, in God bigger than what we can see at the moment, to your point. Um, so last question, I'm really keen to get your feedback on because you're the, well, you have such wealth of knowledge, but you're also one of the subject matter experts that we love be, for a variety mm -hmm. of reasons, but because you're one of the ones that will talk about the things that not everybody else either will or can talk about for a variety of reasons. And that is, uh, the reset with the currencies as it relates to BRICS, right? We talked about that before. So I sent this to you yesterday, but I want this to, you know, be live and fluid for the audience. So I want to play a video for you. This came out yesterday. Very, very powerful. This is the Iranian central bank governor. I hope I'm saying his name right. Muhammad Raza Fazin. And uh, he had a very telling statement that I want to get your impression on. So I'm going to uh, share the screen with you here and then play this. Let me know when you can see it. Got it. You got that? Yeah, I watched this yesterday. Yeah, it was fascinating. Let me see if I can uh, get it up here and I will, uh, if I can get this out, I'll play it for you now. In the BRICS meetings, there were very good agreements made regarding the financial and monetary sphere. Iran made good agreements with the Central Bank of Russia during the period when they were the Secretary of BRICS, and we had good agreements regarding the connection of card networks and monetary and financial cooperation, all of which we have raised in the BRICS. For example, today in the BRICS, the issue of paying for the transactions with local currency is one of the issues, and a very good agreement has been reached. Good agreements regarding global reserve payments and the use of bonds for payment were also made. We now have a global financial system based mostly on the IMF, the World Bank, and Western countries. Unfortunately, due to the political interactions with those countries, today the world is considering other arrangements. Definitely within the BRICS group of countries, such arrangements will be made between the member states. We have a payment system between countries based on local <coughs> currencies. That was one of the topics of this meeting. China, Russia, and Iran are very interested in it. We have moved towards being able to conduct transactions with other countries in local currencies and reduce the role of the U.S. dollar in international transactions. Russia has also made good progress. I think the BRICS countries have developed well and will definitely develop in the future. The new development bank created by BRICS can pursue many of the development goals of the BRICS member countries. Because today, the World Bank operates within the framework of the goals of the United States and Western countries. We hope that NDB will play this role for the BRICS member countries, and we want to become a member of NDB. Okay, so you see that. Hopefully you heard that. He is pretty much a big tell, Andy. We've been kind of uh, surmising what was going to happen. We saw the UN General Assembly a few weeks ago in every country pretty much kind of, you know, quietly said the quiet part out loud about becoming nationalized and peace and prosperity and building up their country's economic resources. And now you have the central bank governor of, of Iran coming out and saying that they want to, uh, which I had asked you about for months for a while, uh, coming out and saying they want to nationalize and power up their countries. You know, BRICS has a very attractive offer on the table with, you know, 40, roughly 40% 40 gold, 30% Russian Chinese bonds, which are just more gold derivatives. So now that he said that, what are your thoughts? It's it's it fits exactly into what I've been talking about about Project Embridge and the unit mm -hmm. token, where Project Embridge is about trading central bank digital currencies with one another, it, and and you know having a strong monetary ecosystem, not reliant upon converting first to to a dollar in the West and at their whims with the central with the um, SWIFT system and and the. KYC and the AML procedures and the time constraint and the sanctions and the cost. And so every country would then trade with one another in local currencies, which we're seeing and trading in digital yuan or, or, or digital rupee or digital, you know, and, or, or in gold. Um, and of course the settlement token is different than that, but it's also traded over Embridge, but this is what we have seen for the better part of a year. You look at 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 China and Russia. Their trade together is almost exclusively in in their local currencies right now, not in dollars anymore. You look at China buying uh, wheat and and corn and soybeans from Brazil and paying for it in in the yuan, which is immediately convertible into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. They're not using dollars. 
Um, and now they'll be able to, using their CBDCs, to trade over Enbridge, so free from the Western interference. So this is exactly what we've been talking about. The key is, is then the unit settlement token, which is independent. And you see all these countries buying gold, right? Well, the unit token is supposed to be 40% gold backed. You see all of these countries repatriating their gold from the Bank of England and the New York Fed because the white paper says they get to hold it within their own borders, put it in an escrow account and have it independently audited. So this is a situation where you can see the crumbs, you can hear it right from uh, this, this gentleman for the Iranian Central Bank, but it doesn't surprise me. It's what we've been told, it's what we've been talking about, and indeed it will happen. It is a way for them to all have their own control of their own economy. They don't have to be reliant upon Beijing or Moscow or Dubai or any central authority in order to trade. You have to make sure that you keep your house in order. Right. And if I have enough, or if I have too much in the way of a trade imbalance, I have too much in the way of rupee or ruble or whatever, for this trade, John, I'm gonna sell you my oil. I would like the settlement currency of the unit, please, which is 40% gold, 60% BRICS plus currencies, not more than any 30% of any one currency to dominate that basket. But if you look at countries like China, by the way, who are in essence backing their currency by gold, if you can exchange those you want into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange, in essence, it is kind of backed by gold, so to speak, in an indirect way. And we keep hearing about Russia, you know, selling their oil to buy more gold, which is the only tier one asset. I mean, it's a self-reinforcing deal. So yes, I think that that is what's going to happen. I think it is what is happening. The question is, do we get the announcement or the acknowledgement that we heard a month ago from um, uh, Delma Rousseff, the president of the IMF, or the um, uh, BRICS uh, New Development Bank, former president of Brazil, do, who said we've agreed in principle to this, trading local currencies over Enbridge and then settlement on the unit token over Enbridge. Do we get that announcement next week? Maybe we do. Uh, and that's when things get very, very exciting. But um, yeah, I think you're spot on, to be honest with you. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. Also, you know, you know, it's over 100 nations being represented a week and Iraq is at the, the forefront of that with the basket you were talking about. So it, it looks like, Andy, with all this said, and we've been tracking it, you and I, for a while, uh, it looks like the world's going to look potentially very different about a week from now. So, Well, it could. And I think the one thing that it's important is to set expectations, right? People right. were disappointed that that didn't happen last year when James mm -hmm. Rickards said it would. And I said it will, but it may not happen now. It could happen. The point of it is the ball's in motion. The genie's out of, you know, the, the genie's out of the bottle. And uh, when does it come all together? Don't know. But you can see that this is a, something in motion. And uh, whether it gets announced formally now or, you know, next year in Brazil, who knows? But I think we're moving in that direction for sure. Yeah, hundred percent. And I had interviewed a week and a half ago, Alistair McLeod, and he had made an emphasis of what you were saying just a minute ago that, um, you know, Russia put a lot of emphasis last year trying to get it done and couldn't do so, but, but courted and spent a considerable amount of time to get to this point. So um, I think I, we personally, we believe this is the beginning of the process unfolding and will bleed into <clears throat> next year and beyond. But this is like the, the Genesis point that, you know, they break out with the elections and the transitions. Perfect time to do it while the proverbial drawbridge is open, if you will. So no, think, you're a smart guy, John, and you see things, I think, in a very logical, clear manner. But thanks. sometimes clarity and logic don't have a um, a correlation with outcome. And, and I think that's sure. a painful lesson that a lot of us learned last year. And it's really a lesson that I've learned over the last 33, four or five years is that, you know, in the end, it's it's pretty tough to run away from the reality of where we're going, but how you get there and what precipitates its final outcome, um, that's the hard part. And this is a very high stakes game, right? This is not a this is not some small trivial deal. You're talking about once in a generation shift away. Um, you know, it was it was the Dutch who gave way to the British, who gave way to the US. Who do we give way to? What does it look like next? Don't know, but there is a change afoot, and I guess we'll see. Of course, next week will certainly be an interesting thing, but, you know, remember the old curse from the Chinese may live in interesting times, and these are interesting, I'll give you that, but uh, I think by the next time we chat, there'll be a lot more clarity, maybe sure. even not just with um, uh, the BRICS meeting, but 
you know, the election and all of these things that are coming coming to a head all at once um, should certainly lead to or lead for a um, setup for a very interesting fall. And uh, as we get towards interesting and sorry, interesting and biblical at the same time, definitely. Yeah, so, biblical indeed, my man. So yes, I'll look stuff. forward to chatting with you again soon and picking up where we left off and yep. seeing how just how accurate we were about these predictions. The only other prediction I might throw into it is that sure. we get a little bit of clarity on the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Eurasian Economic Union, which is two massive groups, massive, that I've said for four years will join the BRICS. The president of Belarus is calling for a summit and has been for a while to get these groups into BRICS. We may get some clarity on that as well. So this is a, a, a larger and larger and larger chorus of countries joining together finding safety in numbers on top of the, at least you get varying reports, but I've heard as many as 59 countries that have thrown their hat in the ring that want to join. We'll see what it looks like, um, you know, right around Halloween, what that looks like. And then mm -hmm. of course the election. So lots to talk about coming up, lots to keep track of, but uh, always good to catch up with you, John. Thanks for having me today. Oh, you too, brother. Always an honor. We appreciate your time. And for those who, you know, are interested in looking at either getting or improving their position in precious metals. You know that we advocate for, as a sponsor, Miles Franklin, uh, 34 years in business with an area complaint, and uh, they are very transparent about their price sheets. And um, I am looking forward to being a, a customer uh, of theirs frequently on the backside of this post RV. And uh, the clients that have worked with them so far, I've heard very, very good reviews. And, and uh, so it's a family business and, and they're very much thorough and dedicated and uh, very, very invested with skin in the game. So um, if you just mentioned my name that, uh, that I referred you, they will certainly take care of you regardless, but they'll give you uh, additional off book pricing, if you will, uh, the best in breed of products and, and availability that they have. And uh, so Andy, would you do me a favor and just do the honors of letting people know where they can reach you? Yeah, so the best place would be to send an info or an email to info at milesfranklin.com, info at milesfranklin.com. John Dowling sent me, request the price list, which we don't publish, which will be really, 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 really competitive. Maybe it's competitive or more so than just about everyone in the country. Uh, and also any questions that you've heard here or that you have regarding this, precious metals IRAs, anything we ever talk about, you name it, we'll answer it. If you want to be contacted, put your phone number down. And if you do request it and you haven't received it within a day or two, check your spam Sometimes these things end up in spam coming from a precious metals company or any corporate entity that sends an email. Sometimes spam filters will catch it. But uh, info at Miles Franklin, you can always give us a call, 952-929-7006. John Dowling sent me and we'll, we'll roll out the red carpet. So uh, until next time, my friend, I hope you and everyone else out there stays well and uh, buckles up for what should be an interesting three or four weeks. To say the least, my good good bench. And also we will leave his links and my contact in the information. Just go under the title where it says more and you'll get all the information Andy just recited. Andy Sheckman, Miles Franklin, thank you for being here. And we look forward to having you again soon. Take care. Take care.